I'm here today with Dr. Nawaz Habib. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm doing great. I read your wonderful book, Activate Your Vagus Nerve, and have a lot to talk to you about it. But uh, first, I'd love to hear a little bit of a background, you know, with, with education and how you got into health and especially holistic methods. And, uh, and we'll dive into more about the vagus nerve. Absolutely. It's a great question. Uh, most people that are in this industry have their own journey, and I'm no exception here. So when I was in chiropractic college, and that's where I started my um, health and wellness kind of journey, I was actually uh, significantly unhealthy at that time. I weighed 250 pounds, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, borderline diabetes, five foot six frame. It just didn't fit. And this was in my 20s. I was definitely going down a negative path while at school learning about health and how to be healthy and obviously was not able to uh, implement a lot of those same tasks or same tools for myself and eventually got to a point where i said this is uh ridiculous i'm i'm actually hurting myself and at that time i said to myself i don't want my future children to have to have the same challenges the same uh, struggles that i'm having i don't want them to go through those uh, health issues so I want to figure out a way to fix my own health issues because my genetics are going to get passed on. What I need to change now is my environment to make sure that the environment that my kids are exposed to does not allow them to go down that same path. So fast forward a little bit, tried some weight loss techniques, figured out that nothing really was working, couldn't really hold the weight off and thought that it was all about weight at the beginning. And then I realized when I was introduced to the idea of functional medicine, by uh, my mentor and really good friend, Sachin Patel, who showed me that there is a better way and that it's about becoming healthy and living well and changing your biochemistry and understanding the stressors that your body is under. And to be able to change the environment then changed the expression of my genes. And thus, I was able to eliminate about 75 pounds of weight. I was able to normalize and optimize my blood pressure, blood sugar, uh, no more health challenges that I was struggling with in my 20s and now reaching up close to 40, feeling significantly better. So that's really the journey that I took into uh, becoming a functional health consultant and working with clients that um, are having similar struggles to me. And, and uh, I realized what was going wrong in my health. I did the right testing. I figured out where the challenges were and I was able to make those changes. Awesome. Well, thank you. And from one who also changed his health habits and all the different people and fortunate people I've gotten to interview, there does seem to be a, um, a, a common thread in that there's some instance that, that causes us to make a decision to grow from it. Um, so one, thank you for that and, and leading a life of service. Um, one of the cool things you mentioned uh, that stuck out for me that I'll tie into now moving to your book is that you said at first you really wanted to, um, because our genes pass on, make a better environment for like your kids and, um, and then all that. And what you really kind of um, begin when you, with your mentor Sachin Patel and begin to make the real uh, different changes the real environment that changed was the internal environment, the environment around the genes. And that's what I love about, you know, different um, new sciences like epigenetics. And so when I was reading your, reading your book, it seemed that it wasn't so much about the vagus nerve. Of course it is because you discuss the science and the functions, which I'd love to hear a little bit about. But the more and more I, I read about it and, and compare it with my different um, or connect the dots with different education I'd read with the meditations and, and other practices from doctors, it's really, and you even had a quote, Sachin Patel said, uh, it was a very nice, um, he took the, the familiar um, quote or saying, uh, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And he kind of moved it into more of a health where you place your, um, what was it? Uh, your, your, 
essentially where your blood goes yeah. uh, or where your, where your thoughts yeah. go, where your blood flows. Yeah, exactly. So, so you, so how are you using, so now I'd love to open up and, and to give the different listeners uh, an idea of the vagus nerve. What is, what is the vagus nerve? What's the most important uh, to know about it right now? Because, uh, because of course, somebody can pick up your book to, to find more about it. Um, its functions, and then most importantly that I'm curious about is how are you using the vagus nerve as kind of the, the tangible, like the physical thing to, to represent all the you know, holistic struggles that we, we all kind of um, experience? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, essentially, the way that the vagus nerve functions and the way that we think about it really uh, goes down to its physical structure. And for me, that was the, the most important factor of, of the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is called vagus, root worded from vague, meaning wandering. It literally goes everywhere. And that in itself is extremely uncommon. There's no other nerve that splits as often, that goes as long that goes to so many different organs and has so many varying functions. And so you almost have to think of it like, is it, is it really doing a single thing or is it just interconnected with so many different organs? So I'll just give your listeners a bit of a breakdown. The vagus nerve is our 10th cranial nerve. We have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. It's commonly referred to as the vagus nerve, but really there's two. There's one on each side of our uh, body and they come out from the brainstem. The importance of the vagus nerve is not lost on us. And this is because when we look at the actual course or the way that it, it courses through our body, it initially begins coursing through uh, an area called the carotid sheath in our neck, literally beside the two most important blood vessels for blood flow to our brain. So that for our brain to function, we need our carotid artery to bring blood to the brain. We need our jugular veins to bring the blood away from the brain. And in that same sheath is the vagus nerve. So it just goes to show from a physical structure perspective how closely tied it is to health and to function. As we go further down through the, uh, into the chest, into the thorax, the vagus nerve then starts splitting up into a few more branches. Send some branches to the muscles at the back of the throat, some branches to the uh, airways essentially. It sends some branches to the heart and to the lungs. And this is important because it actually does control, <clears throat> excuse me, the slowing of our heart rate. When the vagus nerve is activated, when we are under a rest, digest, and recovery state, we are in that parasympathetic state, our heart rate actually starts to come down into a recovery zone. So actually checking your heart rate is a really good way to note whether you're in a more parasympathetic state or if your body is more stressed just as a, a simple tool that most of us have these wearable devices and we're able to manage or measure that specifically. We're also going to get information to the lungs. Are we in a calm state? Are we breathing with our diaphragm? Are we doing the right type of deep breathing? Or are we breathing with our traps and our upper back muscles, the accessory muscles, and in a more shallow breathing state when we're more under stress? So we're actually getting that feedback to the brain through the vagus nerve as well. It then continues to course down through the diaphragm. It actually pierces the muscle and uh, goes down into our abdomen. And it uh, literally attaches to every single organ within the abdomen. Stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and gallbladder, liver, spleen, kidneys, you name it. Essentially, every organ has some interconnection with the vagus nerve. And the importance of that is not lost on me because essentially what it's trying to say is it's the thermostat figuring out what is going on inside those organs. We know the importance of the gut. We know the importance of the gut microbiome. We know the importance of liver function with regards to the 500 some odd functions that the liver itself has. When any one of those organs, when any one of those areas is not functioning optimally, that data is sent up to the brain through the vagus nerve. And that's really, really important. And why I'm able to then say from a physical structure perspective why the vagus nerve is so important is because it's the way that we get information from our gut, from our liver, from our spleen, from our kidneys, back to our brain. 85% of the information on the nerve is actually um, 
specifically coming up from those organs to the brain. That's what you uh, call in the book or the, or what the ter scientific term is afferent nerves. Afferent nerves. Afferent. Yes. Afferent. And efferent means it goes from the brain to. Efferent is from the brain to other areas. Yes. So um, out of curiosity, what, why, why the title activate the vagus nerve? Because so, it's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the title partially was publisher saying, let's go with a, a simple title, but also was because a lot of us are living under chronic stress. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are living in, a, in an area where we're not able to recover very well. And what tends to happen mm -hmm. when we're under that chronic stress is we're actually limiting our ability to function under a recovery parasympathetic vagus activated state. Mm -hmm. And so yes, we're never really ever going to shut off the vagus nerve, but we truly want to make sure that we have control of it and be able to move it into a more activated state more often. We should truly be in a parasympathetic vagus activated state about 80% of the time, 80 to 85% of the time, where most of us are spending about 50, 60% yeah. on the opposite side in that stressed, chronic, sympathetic zone. So diving into in the in holistic uh, what really inspired me to get into uh, health is you know i was making a transition from business and i played college basketball and i loved the like the zone that you would get into what what led me to kind of go into health was i didn't just want to study like the nutrition or the fitness but really how everything is interconnected and that's what I love about the vagus nerve because it really seems to show based on its functions. And, you know, there's, there's different physiological functions, but one of the ones that stuck out to me is how you talk about how it allows us to create um, memories and, but not specifically just memories, but allowing us to create greater memories and associations with the world around you and those important to you, which, also dives into how you're saying a lot of us have been or still do live in a lot of stress because of the perception or the association of what's really going on um, <laughs> around us. Um, and the vagus nerve really, man, I, 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 I can see how you're, you kind of were passionate and got into it because it's like validation almost like how the information from your gut, like what you eat, does lead to how you're thinking. What's, how, how your brain is taking the information from the food because of the information relayed from the vagus nerve, and then that is directly correlating with your, your perception. So it's, it's, it's definitely very, very cool. Another thing uh, I'd love to have you, um, talk a little bit more about is you brought up an interesting question. Um, I don't remember the exact um, word, so help me out here, please. Um, how we are learning when we're lifting or um, our muscles, are we really, and your question was, are we really training the muscles or training the nerve to send a signal to the muscle? Could you yeah. talk a little bit about that? I feel like that goes very well with um, really more like epigenetics and how our, our, our flow controls the function. Absolutely. Um, two great questions. So I'll, I'll dive first into the, uh, memories. I love it. <laughs> so our ability to produce memories is very strongly linked to the emotional and physiological state that we are in. From a physiological state perspective, we're looking specifically, are, are we in a more sympathetic, chronic stressed, um, fight or flight type of state more often, or are we in that parasympathetic rest, digest, recovery state? And the ability to create memories is tied strongly to our ability to sense and our emotions that we have accordingly. So we have essentially a lens through which we see the world. This is essentially our mindset. This is our, our perception, our personal perspective. What we need to look at is 
depending on the type of state that we are generally living in, we're going to associate certain emotions. When we're in a negative stressed state, we're going to create a negative emotional pattern that's going to then trigger uh, a memory of sadness or yeah. uh, of loss of stress, right? Where our ability to truly create positive memories and positive emotions is linked to being in that rest, digest, recovery state. And we tend to be, when we're in that rest, digest, recovery state, we tend to be more mindful, more aware of what our senses are uh, bringing in, our senses of taste, smell, touch, sight, and uh, hearing, right? That, all the things that we can hear. And when we're in a stress state, generally we're not being mindful of our external environment. And so in order to truly create a positive memory of, of the truth that's happening around us, we need to become aware and have full mindfulness of what's going on around us. That can't happen in a, a sympathetic activated state. It has to happen in a vagus parasympathetic state. That's where a lot of this biochemistry then leads to, if we look at the neurotransmitters, the actual patterns of production of memories internally. We can't do it when, the, when we're under stress. We don't, we're not sending blood flow to that area. We're sending blood flow to the hindbrain, worried about living in the moment and surviving the moment. Is that because um, all of our attention is focused on like what the cause with, of, of a perceived threat is? Yeah, absolutely. Because at that time, we're focused on survival. We're focused on getting so it's through. Like a, it's kind of like a benefit, physiological benefit. Like if, a, if an animal perceives a threat, it wants to it wants to use all of the body's available resources to to get safe, to stay safe. Exactly, fight or flight. Right? Is yeah. either we attack what's stressing us or we get away from it, and it's all about survival at that time. And so, yeah, we we feel the emotion, we feel the negative intensity. For some people, it's a very positive stressor. But if we're in that state chronically for too long, too many hours a day, that's where it can create these problems and create negative emotions and not give you the ability to properly produce memories. And that's why we have so many skewed memories. So diving into now the vagus nerve and your, your oh, I guess I can say it's kind of like the language or like we said earlier, a tangible area in which you're helping show clients and different readers and listeners to, for your podcast, um, where different mindset or limited or perhaps limited associated memories may manifest on. Um, what's a benefit of a, a um, attending or looking at the the physiological things you can do first as opposed to well i mean they really go well in combination with but uh as opposed to really diving straight at the um the person's associations with a certain uh or perception of of the world like to help them bring awareness to Maybe they're every time they're at work around a certain coworker, it's it's triggering them to be in a state of stress. Yeah, we tend to have specific emotional triggers based on patterns that we've created over time, and these patterns can either be very negative and stressful. It's again based on that yeah. mindset and that perspective that we have, and we could also have very positive emotions, right? The idea of feeling safe and comforted mm -hmm. by a loved one, for example. Like for me, it tends to be just feeling comforted by my mom or just the association of uh, going back to your childhood home. If you had a very positive experience there for me very much. So um, the idea of just going home and you literally just feel comfortable and, and yeah. whatnot. But if you go to work and there's a coworker that you're not jiving well with, then obviously there's going to be a negative emotion. The key thing here in, in shifting your physiological state and allowing the thing to become positive is mindfulness is becoming aware of the truth around you rather than the story you're telling yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the really big thing is what if that coworker is going through a very negative, stressful relationship? What if they're having their own challenges and they're unaware of what's going on and they're unable to process their own issues and they're bringing that to you. 
where we need to become objective. We are not the subject of their stress. We just happen to be in, in their path. So this is where we can create positive associations and shift that by physiologically just taking a moment, taking a breath, breath being the key to vagus activation and being able to shift our state into that positive parasympathetic rest, digest, recovery state so we can create that positive emotion. And what happens when we do that is we actually send the blood flow rather than going to the hind brain, the back of the brain, we actually send blood flow to the forebrain, right into the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And that's where we make our logical decisions. When we are unable to send blood flow to that frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, we don't make good decisions. We tend to work, we tend to make more emotional or, or mm -hmm. more rigid decisions. And so when we're in that sympathetic state, we're not thinking clearly. And so we create negative emotions and we allow the emotions to take over the situation rather than the actual objective truth. When we're in that parasympathetic vagus state, the blood flow comes to the front. We're very clear. We're very logical. We're understanding. We've taken that deep breath and shifted our physiology so that we can now create a positive association and understand that it's not about us and we can shift away from it. It's uh, interesting because a lot of us think that we're thinking consciously and uh, but, but it's really still run by emotions. Yeah. So, uh, what kind of um, meditation and uh, mindfulness are you recommending to your clients and different readers and listeners? I, I know you mentioned it a little bit in the um, book, but I'd also love to hear what you are uh, practicing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not a proponent of a single type. I think there's so much variety and so much variation and people need to figure out where they're at and what works for them individually. So for me personally, what works quite well is being in nature, spending some time outdoors, getting some fresh air, whether that's going for a walk by myself, whether that's driving my car as fast as I'm possibly legally allowed to, <laughs> or going for a bike ride, right? So this summer, I spent a lot of time actually on my bike, obviously with the lockdowns and everything going on, you yeah. wanna to try to get as much physical activity as possible. And so I went on a lot of bike rides early in the morning, get, get out, get some fresh air. And that for me was a very meditative experience. Mm -hmm. I wasn't overly straining myself. I wasn't pushing myself to go faster and faster. I was just taking my time and I knew that it was either 43 to 46 minutes for me to get to my destination, sit down. Funny enough, it was with my father-in-law. So we would sit down, have some coffee, maybe a couple of friends would join us. And then it was 43 to 45 minutes back as well. And that for me was a very meditative, calming experience because I was able to connect with myself. I was able to connect with nature. I was able to do this right beside the lake here in, in Toronto. So I was able to drive or ride right by there and just feel the calmness and always have that, that reminder to uh, take a breath and to be calm. And, and anytime any stressful situation came up, uh, as we know this year has been a whole lot of stress, we've been able to then, I, I was able to luckily shift my physiology and say, no, I was able to go biking. I was able to learn all of these things. And it was a, a practice of gratitude and being able to bring that in. So, for some people, it can include physical activity. For some people, a very strong meditation, mm -hmm. as we know it from, from what it's called, uh, or from the practices that have been there, where they're sitting there in OM or listening to a guided meditation or whatnot, can be very, very beneficial as well. So essentially, any time where you can pull yourself out of, the sub, out of being the subject of uh, an an issue and going into that objective state and yeah. focusing on your breath and focusing on getting away from the stressfulness of outside, that would be what I would call uh, an effective tool to get into that meditative calming uh, state. And generally, like I'll, I'll talk to people about different ways to activate their vagus nerve, different breathing uh, tools that they can use, uh, cold showers and, and all of the other stuff that we'll I'm sure talk about very soon. Yeah. But the idea is, find out where you're at, figure out when you feel most calm, what are you doing? What are those challenges that you tend to be able to overcome more easily when you're in that positive state? 
And I like to make sure that I meet people where they're at. Awesome. I think you hit the nail on the, the head when you mentioned, and it ties in what you mentioned earlier, about really kind of the autonomic nervous system and the, the vagus nerve seems to be activated when we are out of our own way. And I'm a big uh, proponent and practicer of meditation and fine, you know, like you mentioned earlier, when you're in your stress state, your, your attention is really focused on the cause, the thing that caused you to feel in danger. And so with the practice of the meditation or the different mindful uh, practices, even with the exercises, like you mentioned, it really helps, you know, focus more, uh, more uh, divergently, which allows you to get out of your uh, conscious brain because that also when we're like, I, I, I read and I learned that if we're thinking and analyzing within the conscious like our neocortex, it's only making the brain worse. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, I, I've found that the meditation really helps with kind of getting beyond yourself and allowing the, the body to go in more of this vital, what is it, vitalistic health method and allowing it to heal itself. Yeah, it's, no question about it. I just realized we actually forgot to uh, speak a little bit about the neuroplasticity and the idea of training mm. the nerve rather than the muscle. I'd want to quickly um, go back there and make sure I answer that. So when we are born, we have no specific neural network that's been built to be strong, right? So our, our hands are as good as our feet. Neither are working really effectively. We don't have... Uh, dexterity with our fingers. We don't have uh, micro control over everything that we're doing in our fingers nor in our toes. Over the years, we train ourselves to be able to pick up a pencil or write with these things or be able to type with our fingers, but not with our toes. And because we're doing that repetitively, what we're actually doing is we're creating neural circuits and creating uh, stronger nerve patterns within our brains to send info to those muscles. That's what's actually being trained when we're doing any of the exercises that we're talking about. So if somebody goes and learns how to do bicep curls a million times, they're not, they're, they're building their muscle, but they're not necessarily training the muscle. They're actually training the neural network for that action, right? The same with any athlete in any specific sport. What, what they're essentially building is resilience within whatever environment is around them. So let's think of, for example, a professional golfer, for example, okay? Doesn't matter what the environment from a weather barometric perspective, whatever that stuff is, whatever lie the golf ball is sitting in, they have created a shot that they believe, and they've practiced this shot a million times that it's going to travel your 150 yards from the pin, let's, make sure to hit it 150 yards. And the reason that those pros and the people that are at the top of their game can consistently hit the ball that far is because mm -hmm. over time they've trained the neural networks to know what they need to do to get to that 150 yard, regardless of the environmental circumstances. The muscles themselves change. They, they adjust to the situation, but the nerves are really the ones that are doing the job. Thanks for... Um going back and bringing all that up it's it's also um it reminded me of the different studies i'd read about and how because like you you brought up and with the brilliant question that we're training the nerves therefore with the meditation and the visualization we can because the body is objective we can train, you know, with, through, with our mind, with the visualizing those, we can kind of activate those nerves. And there were different studies. I'm sure you may have read about the, with like the piano players, or I think there was even one where people did bicep curls and those, they had different groups where one would play physically the piano and then others 
would just mentally rehearse it, but they had to be very clear. But the, but the percentage of how much they actually learned the pieces was just as much, if not the same, as those who actually practiced it. Yeah, and I think that in itself, I love these studies. They were absolutely wonderful in proving that it wasn't the physical yeah. or the muscular movement that was required for it. It was training the neural network, the thought mm -hmm. process. What do I need to execute in order to do this? This is why visualization techniques work so well mm -hmm. in practice, in, in training, because you don't physically need to be there shooting the 150 yards. What does it look like when you're hitting that 100? What does that shot look like? What does it look like from the backswing perspective? What lie angle? What position am I in? And you're visualizing through all of the different scenarios and you're actually creating or building that neural network regardless of whether you're doing it Incredible. physically or not. I love uh, applying it in, and um, having different clients use that visualization for not just in a sport, but what anything. Yeah, and absolutely. Wow, that's we could go on about that, it, but it is very. Uh, it's it's just incredible. It's it's almost like it's kind of more than visualization, though, because you you have to get to a place where you know you're incorporating the different senses, yeah. The, how how it feels and the emotions, and that's that requires a whole other. It well, does. I, I love the idea, but it, it, it links back to the idea of pulling yourself out of the situation that you're mm -hmm. in and visualizing through all of the senses that you can really only experience when you're in a parasympathetic state, that this is what I'm in, this is what it's going to feel like and retraining that. And it's the mastery to be able to pull yourself out of the current situation and put yourself in a new one. So it's visualization to the nth, nth degree. Yeah. Ah, gosh, love it. All right, Dr. Habib. Um, I'm curious, before we dive into really the um, different action items um, that you mentioned, and I love at the very end of the book, you have the different, uh, you know, daily, weekly, and monthly practices set out for you. Um, what different tests do you um, recommend um, for like overall well well-being somebody could take to also, you know, get a good maybe supplement, um, uh, different information on like their, um, goodness, the different nutrients and like what, yeah. what supplements are good for them. Kind of, you know, there's lots of different gut tests and things nowadays. I'd love to hear your recommendations. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of great options out there and, and every day there's going to be new ones that are coming out. And I'm, I'm very happy for this. I, I truly believe in the idea of human ingenuity helping to drive um, our growth and our, our development. Functional lab testing is, is really a great way to get answers as to where the issues truly are coming from. We know that blood work can give us some information. There are some really great important things and great important numbers that come from blood work, but it's not the end all and be all. Our body eliminates so much and we tend to just discard it and not think about it. But we get a lot of really great information from urine testing and from stool testing and from breath testing, depending on what information we're kind of looking for. So on an individual basis, we want to make sure that we get to know how our cells are functioning. So the majority of people that I tend to work with will get two tests. The first one will be a urinary organic acid test. I think or organic acid testing is a really, really strong tool in helping to identify nutrient deficiencies, cellular function, getting to know what challenges are coming up from a cellular function perspective and what somebody can then do about it. And this is where we can get really good supplement information and um, get to know individuality as to what we need to do um, with each person that we are working with. The important thing to remember though is that these nutrients are not deficient for no reason there's truly always going to be a reason so for somebody who's eating a completely healthy diet working out as they should be why would they even be deficient in any of these nutrients and the answer to that is let's go look in the gut all of these nutrients for the most part come in through the gut and gut function is the most important driver of our overall health okay about 30% of what we do uh, from a health perspective or what we experience from a health perspective is based on genetics, but about 70% is based on the environment that we're in 
both external and internal environment. And so when we're talking about internal environment, more commonly than not, we're talking about the gut, where, where those nutrients are coming from. We have to look at bacteria, parasites, viruses, yeast, worms, so many different things that could be present that are stealing these nutrients away from you. So you could be eating the healthiest diet, but still be deficient in B12 because a parasite is present that likes B12 that requires it and is taking it away from you. Or you could be experiencing bloating or gut health challenges because you have overgrowth commensal bacteria. And those bacteria are creating negative um, challenges and bloating because they're not in the right place. They're not in the large intestine. They've moved into the small intestine. So getting to know the gut really truly is the most important place. From a retail perspective, things like Viome are a great test. From a clinical perspective, I like the GI map stool test from Diagnostic Solutions. That's the one I tend to go to. Um, it being the most broad and, and most accurate of tests because it is a DNA PCR test. So we're able to quantify uh, bacteria, parasites, viruses, yeast, worms, know which ones are pathogenic, which ones are overgrowth, and get to know why a lot of challenges are happening. There's also other intestinal markers that come from there as well that are really important to know. So from those two tests, I tend to be able to show somebody where the gut health challenges are coming from and why then they are deficient in the nutrients that we then see on the organic acid test. And we'll then use the organic acid test on kind of a yearly basis to see how they've been doing, what's progressing, what's not. What's a, what's a resource for the, like the organic acid test? I hadn't heard. Yeah. So we use um, generally from Genova Diagnostics, um, their organic acid test. Um, there's even Great Plains Lab is an, another great option as well for the oat. Cool. I'll have to look into those. I'm, I've always been interested in getting a different um, test to just to see what's, what's going on. Um, but if you find like somebody has, uh, for an example, like a parasite that seems to be stealing all the different nutrients in the gut. Um, do you uh, do you go after it with the new different nutritional things first, or helping more on a um, a mental kind of side? What's what's more effective start? So for functional health, uh, this is where where we're able to really do some really cool stuff. What essentially functional medicine, functional health, functional wellness is, is actually being able to look at get, getting the data of what's going on using new technology, new testing, new research and science, but be able to back it up with uh, old traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic um, therapies and remedies that have been there for thousands and thousands of years that we're now realizing have worked better than probably any medication ever could. And so what we're able to do is marry the two together, the, the new science and the old world knowledge and wisdom, being able to pull them together. So yes, this does include dietary recommendations. This does include looking at the liver and making sure that we have the right amino acids that are present to make sure that liver detoxification is functioning at its highest level. It includes making vagus nerve changes and giving exercises that are really effective and making sure that our state shifts to that parasympathetic rest, digest, and here's a key word, recovery, mm -hmm. being able to recover from the stressors that do come up because we're going to have stressors come up. So when we are unable to recover, we need to make sure the vagus nerve is strong to be able to get to that point where we then can recover. And then being able to look at, uh, specific herbs to help knock out which bacteria, parasites, viruses, yeast, and worms that have been there for thousands of years. Things like Mastica chios, which has been proven to be really good against H. pylori, or things like Mastic, or uh, excuse me, Mimosa pudica, which have been shown to be great for parasites, things like that. And so there are lots of different types of herbs and supplements, and we want to make sure that it's very individualized, that the care is specific, mm -hmm. that there's a specific path that we follow to make sure that we're not just knocking something out and creating another problem elsewhere. Well, I'll have to look into all those and, and try those different tests. I know just sometimes when I've considered and, and one time got a, um, it was more of like a bioenergetic test. I felt like it was coming out of a place of like stress or putting too much attention like on the body. 
as opposed to kind of just resting into uh, the situation and the, like kind of what we were talking about, like broadening the perspective and allowing the, the body to kind of t heal itself. Cool. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And bioenergetic testing, there's a lot of validity to sure. a lot of what's going on there. Um, science and scientific nature isn't exactly the most promising in, in the way that we can show that bioenergetic testing is great, but I do believe that there is a lot of value to, to be had from understanding the energy of the body and being able to measure and manage it. I'd love to uh, hear um, the different action items people can do, especially like the unique ones that I hadn't um, hadn't realized about, like the sleeping on the the right side or the left side. Very interesting, by the way. That um, uh, I, I'm Jewish and we have the Torah, and apparently one of the the ancient teachings was that you sleep on your left side at the beginning of the night and then you roll over somehow <laughs> to the right side by the end of the night. So I just love uh, kind of correlating those um, connections. Um, but that one in like the gargling and the humming, please, uh, it's all very cool. For sure. It, it comes down to knowing the and, and understanding how vagus nerve is coursing again and where we can actually create a change in our physiology based on activating that nerve specifically. So like I said, there were certain branches of the vagus nerve that go to the muscles of the throat, mm -hmm. muscles of the larynx, the pharynx, and making sure that the airways stay open, patent, able to um, allow us to breathe. And there's other branches, there's one specific branch that goes, it's the auricular branch of vagus that goes to skin of the ear. Those two areas tend to be very overlooked. We don't generally think of those as vagus nerve uh, innervation areas, but that's where we can have really positive effects. If you ever have watched um, in, in Hindu culture, when you're meditating, there's a very specific tool that they use where they are using the word om, mm -hmm. right? And, and the humming that occurs when om is being said, what's happening is we're actually activating the vagus nerve to stimulate vibration in the muscles here around the vocal cords. The reason I have any pitch or tone in my voice, the ability to go really, really high or really, really low is because of vagus nerve function. Wow. It's actually te telling the laryngeal muscles how much tension to put on the vocal cords, allowing them to stretch or not, allowing them to release tension accordingly. So that allows for pitch in our voice. When we're saying OM, we're creating a very strong vibration inside there. It's really cool because we're looking at old world wisdom and showing that in research, our HRV, our, our marker of vagus nerve function, heart rate variability increases when we do these things. So it's showing how effective those old world wisdoms were. That's awesome. And it's, it's cool learning all that and hearing from you and also reading the different science behind it and how science is really the language that's explaining all of this and bringing us all together. It's, uh, I didn't know that about uh, the ohm and how it's the, what it what, was it the resonate of the yeah. universe. Yeah. And in, in uh, Hebrew, we have the word shalom, you know, and I found very it very strongly connected. Yes. Yeah. And I found it very cool. I, I don't think it was my own kind of insight or, <laughs> but I read in a book and how, you have the ohm is like you were saying, it's the very, the resonance, resonance of the universe. And it's a very kind of like creating a kind of calm, peaceful um, sound. And then on the sh, the sh, sh part, the sh is like the chaotic kind of, you know, everything's moving around the like, uh, what's the scratchy kind of thing. But what's beautiful, I love about, I got it, um, a friend through a meditation once using the shalom, shalom as the word. And it kind of, it means peace. It means tranquility. It, yeah. it puts those together. So it's, I feel like that goes very well also with this older, um, the, our older wisdom with this new age kind of uh, science. That sounds awesome. It's almost like the shift from stress to yeah. calm through shalom. I really love that. Yeah. So what are a couple of the um, um, actions? And then 
Uh, I know you have a, another call coming up, so uh, please also with, with doing that share where people can uh, learn more about you and sure. your Ener energy boost challenge I think you have and re picking up your book. Yeah, so a couple uh, more exercises that we can go through, really simple things. Deep breathing is number one, for sure. Understanding uh, your current breath pattern. So I'm doing this, uh, for those who are listening, I'm doing this standing up. I make sure that I do all of my calls anytime I'm on video with somebody, every time I'm, I'm um, doing a podcast interview or an, uh, working with a patient, I'm standing. And the reason for that is I'm showing up. I'm here, I'm, I'm present with you but it also forces me to get into a postural situation where I can breathe more effectively. And breathing effectively means not using the accessory breathing muscles of our chest and upper back. So what I have patients do is I have them put one hand on their chest, one hand on their belly, and then take a deep breath in. I feel like I actually am lifting my shoulders quite a bit. And more commonly than not, that's exactly what will happen. I'll hear that the top hand is the one that's moving, that the chest is expanding rather than the belly. We should, when we're breathing in, have expansion or movement of our bottom hand, the hand that's on our belly. And we should not really have much movement at all in our upper hand. Okay, very on little. On the chest or the shoulder? On the chest. Oh. So the chest itself should not be expanding when we're breathing in too much. Okay, the shoulders may follow or the shoulders will cause movement to occur, but it tends to be when, with a deep breath, it tends to be the chest that expands more. And what we're looking for is movement at the bottom of the lungs and more diaphragmatic movement. So more of the belly movement is actually a sign of vagus nerve activation and uh, diaphragmatic breathing at the lower lobes of the lung. Another really great book to read about that, by the way, is called Breath. Um, I forget the gentleman's name who James wrote Nestor. it. Pretty neat. That's it. Yeah, James Nestor's book. That's have right. you read, uh, sorry to jump in really quick, but I have one by uh, Anders Olsen called Conscious Breath or Breathing. I have Breathing. not read it, no, unfortunately. He has this oh, device yeah. that I use. It's called a relaxator and it restricts the flow. He also, the, your book was the second time uh, I heard about sleep tape. Yeah. Um, but he has this device that restricts the flow. So when you're like going on a walk, you breathe in through the nose. And then when you exhale with the mouth, it's like a restricted longer. Yeah. So that and that's it, actually vagus activating as well. So a really yeah. great way is when we're doing that breathing pattern, now we want to get to the next level. We focus on doing a breath that is, let's say, for example, and the numbers can, can vary, but it's a, a one to two ratio, one inhale for every two exhale. So Let's say we're doing four seconds of inhalation. Hold for two seconds and then a breath out very slowly through pursed lips, eight seconds. That one to two ratio tends to work really, really well in shifting that physiology into that parasympathetic vagus activated state. Another really great option would be alternate nostril breathing as well. The idea of being able to shift the airflow through both sides and getting uh, that pattern occurring as well. So another really great tool um, is the alternate nostril breathing for sure. And then I'll bring up the cold showers because I did mention them earlier as well. So now we've learned to breathe really well. Diaphragm is moving correctly. We're doing four seconds in, eight seconds out. Now, how do we train the nerve, the vagus nerve, to be able to do this under stress? Well, we, like, yeah. let's say, for example, bicep curls, you can do them at five pounds and you go to 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 20 pounds. Increase the stress level because you want to increase the muscle girth. Of, of course, you want to increase the muscle strength, but you're creating that neural network that's stronger. In order to create the stress with vagus nerve exercises, we need to put ourselves in a stressful scenario that we can control and still focus on that optimal breathing pattern. So a cold shower is exactly that, or even taking a, a dip in a cold pool, for example, same idea. What you're trying to do is create a circumstance where your body is not comfortable. It's under stress. And so a cold shower is wonderful, especially after you jump off your Peloton or your bike or whatever you're on. The idea is to help bring everything down and you train your body to be able to do that. So you throw some cold water on an area of your body that tends to be a little bit more sensitive. For me, it's the back of my neck. 
I remember doing it this morning, it was not comfortable today. Turn that water down as cold as you possibly can and let it hit you. And what you do is you just, you're going to take a moment where you get into this yeah. sympathetic, activated, stressed state. And your goal is to be able to shift yourself out of it and go back to that diaphragmatic breathing pattern that's going to be really effective down the road. Cool. All right. And, then and then for anyone who's in uh, Texas, like me, <laughs> where the shower is uh, anything <laughs> but cold, even on the coldest. <laughs> <laughs> See if you can jump in uh, a pool. A pool. <laughs> a pool or an ice bath would be a great idea as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So those are great ways to activate the vagus nerve. And I've gone over about uh, 20 to 25 different ones in the book itself um, with daily, monthly, and weekly practices that you can all uh, very easily do. And the vast majority of these cost zero dollars to do. So they're very, very simple tools that anyone can implement in their life. So it's cool. in regards to finding out more about me, following a little bit more along with my work, I tend to be a little bit more active on Instagram. You can look me up, Dr. Navaz Habib on Instagram. Um, you can learn more about what we do with our clients at healthupgraded.com. And um, you can listen to my podcast as well, the Health Upgrade podcast, uh, available on all the podcast uh, channels. Put some links. Exactly. Dr. Navaz, it's been incredible and a lot of fun and thank you for all all your work it's a pleasure to be introduced and to open this conversation it's my absolute pleasure thank you for the honor of uh, inviting me awesome take